All right, everybody, we've got a real treat for you today. We're going to take a look at A Chorus Over the Blues by one of my favorite musicians on the entire planet, Melissa Aldana. And this one's a real doozy. It has some advanced concepts, but this one just kind of captures the wonder of how somebody can get so good and can be thinking at such a high level. So, of course, there are things that we could take action on in this, but really it's just kind of cool to look at this on paper and understand what Melissa is doing. And just think about how she got to the point where she could play like this. So this is a chorus from her solo on A Pravav from the YouTube series Live at Emmett's Place with Emmett Cohen. And I'll include a link to the video with a timestamp to this exact chorus so that you can go and check it out yourself. Of course, due to copyright and stuff like that, I can't actually play the original recording, so you're going to have to deal with me playing it on saxophone. But the whole performance is absolutely amazing, so I highly suggest going to check it out. Okay, so let's start by just looking at the chorus on its own, and then we'll talk about some of the things that at least I'm thinking about when I look at this chorus and how I can sort of gather some of these ideas in my own playing. So here's the chorus. <laughs> So of course, you could tell just by hearing it and seeing it on paper, there's some serious stuff going on here. The middle of that chorus is absolutely ridiculous in terms of how much tension she's building and how she's using that tension in unexpected places. And she's carrying that tension over a lot longer than a lot of us would think to. And that's where I think sort of uh, it will open our minds to a different way of thinking. And in my mind, what it does is it shows us kind of at the end of the day, once you reach a certain level, there's really no rules. Now, I've created a sheet where I kind of like color-coded things and tried to point out what I think is going on, and I want that to be a huge disclaimer. This is just what I think is going on. And there's something we should talk about before we look at that. And that is, I think if you were to ask Melissa what she was thinking about when she was playing this solo, she would probably say nothing. And I think that has to do with all of the hard work that she's done in the practice room, working through things slowly and coming up with new ideas and investigating those ideas and eventually getting those ideas to the point where they're like muscle memory. And she has a whole bunch of stuff that she could just play on command without thinking about the individual notes. Instead, she could think about more of the chorus as a whole. And one word I want to use that I think is really important is colors. You know, a lot of this tension that she's building, I almost think about it like she's using a certain color. And it's much less about like, I am going to put this chord substitution here and I'm going to do this exact thing here. And it's more about being such a complete improviser that you could just think about certain colors that you want to play and you wouldn't even be sure about exactly what would come out of your instrument until you actually played it. But you've investigated so many different ways and so many paths through the changes and so many different sounds that you're pretty sure it's just going to come out in a way that makes a lot of sense and is pretty slick. Now again, I am totally inferring that. I haven't had a chance to ask Melissa if that's the way that she thinks. It's just sort of what I gather from this. So let's look at the chorus line by line with some of my ideas and appropriately a color coded version of this. So let's start with the first line measures one through four. All right, so we hear her open up the melody actually with a quote from a different song entirely. And this is just pure genius. She actually quotes this a lot throughout her entire solo on this recording. This is a quote from a Thad Jones song called Three and One, and it's the opening phrase to that song. And then it keeps going. So if you've never heard that song, go and check it out because she is quoting that melody at the beginning of the solo. And what a great launching point for what she's about to do. Now, you'll notice in bars two, three, and the first half of four, I have it color coded in blue because I think this is sort of the first color that she plays. And it appears to be something that generally relates to B flat minor seven. Most of the notes totally fit into that key. And even where there's one note outside of that key, it's part of like kind of an enclosure to B flat. So to me, this is 
a B flat minor sort of sound. She might not have been thinking that, but that's what the color sounds like to me. And she launches right in bar two into this incredible line. <laughs> And you could see, as it relates to the chord changes, it seems to be completely independent of them. Of course, there's a lot of really cool tension notes in there, but I think she's just thinking about this color. And then what happens at the very end of measure four is a very clear device, which is kind of cool to see her using something that maybe a lot of us use, which is just a tritone substitution. So she's playing a D flat triad in first inversion, over a G7 chord, which is the definition of a tritone substitution. So she plays. But here's the thing about Melissa is that where most people would resolve that F down to an E on the C7 chord and release the tension, she does not. So now if we look at bars five through eight, we see this new color starting over the four chord. And I think that this generally can be characterized as some kind of F sharp seven chord, maybe with a flat nine. But again, that's sort of like less important than just understanding that she's using this color that involves a lot of sharps over that C7 chord. And again, have you noticed that she has not released the tension at all? She just keeps building it and building it and building it over these next two measures. So these measures sound like this. Just amazing. Another just beautiful dissonant color over the chords that are actually happening underneath. All right, so then in bar seven, even more tension. And I'm thinking about this as kind of like a altered or diminished sound over that G7 chord. It could be either because the collection of notes that she's using is in both the altered scale and the dominant diminished scale. But again, the real thing to notice here is that she switches colors, but it's still more tension. And then finally in bar eight, she plays something that's a little more recognizable. What she's doing is she's just outlining that six chord. She's playing one, three, five, seven, flat nine over that E7 chord. So this is the first time that we've seen her play something that's pretty inside of that chord change. <laughs> And it's like a breath of fresh air to finally hear something that's a little more quote unquote inside the changes. So if we play that entire phrase five through eight, this is what it sounds like. <laughs> And then that line over bar eight really propels us into bar nine, which is of course the two, five, one. And here's the really cool thing. Most of us are gonna reach for most of our tension and release over the two, five, one. That's a very uh, traditional place to use tension and release. But actually this is the most inside part of the entire solo. And the only sort of uh, device that she's using that's really recognizable is she does this enclosure to the third on beat two. I have that color coded in red. So she's doing two notes from above. She goes a whole step above the C, a half step above the C, a whole step below the C, and then lands on the target note, which is that C. Notice that it's on a strong beat, beat three. But besides that, this is a pretty inside line. So she kind of flips everything on its head where we would normally build tension is actually where she's playing inside. And then where a lot of us would play really inside, which is like the meat of the form, those bars two through bar seven, she's playing completely outside and building tension, building tension, building tension. So now after breaking that down a little bit, let's hear it again, the whole chorus. <laughs> So what can we take away from this? Well, to me, it's just a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking I don't always have to put my tension in the same places in every chorus. I don't always have to use tension where I'm taught to use tension, which is like cadence points, cadential points in the form. I'm kind of free to use tension wherever I want to 
if I can do it in as complete of a way as Melissa's doing it, which is obviously gonna take us all a very, very long time to be able to do. But this one inspires me to just think outside of the box a little bit more and practice these sounds and concepts and ways of building tension more deeply because I'm starting to see the fruits of working on that, which is the level of mastery that Melissa is displaying here. So getting to the point where I can think about these certain collections of notes over certain chords more as colors than playing like exact patterns or something like that is what I take away from this. I would love to know what you take away from this. So let me know in the comments below what you think about this solo. So thanks to Melissa for all the inspiration. She is just one of my favorite players and it's just absolutely amazing what she can do and the level that she is at. So hope you enjoyed this video and we'll see you on another one soon. Have a good one, everybody. Bye.